You're listening to The Bible for Normal People, the only God-ordained podcast on the internet. I'm Pete Enns. And I'm Jared Bias. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of The Bible for Normal People. Before we jump in, just want to mention that we have a class. If you haven't heard the last few weeks, we have the book, Exodus for Normal People, out now. We thought it would be great to do a one-night class as well on Exodus, you know, because we just can't get our fill of Exodus. So, February 25th, 8.30 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. It's called Beyond the Prince of Egypt, How to Read the Book of Exodus Like an Adult. Pete, you want to give a word about what you'll be doing? Yeah, way beyond the Prince of Egypt. So, yeah, the the Book of Exodus is intriguing, challenging, complicated, and there are just a lot of moving parts. So, we were going to talk about that in an hour with some Q&A afterwards and just sort of highlights about What's going on in this book and what it means to read this book with adult eyes and not just sort of as a story we know as children? Yep. So, go to thebiblefornormalpeople.com front slash prince to learn more. It's pay what you can. So, we don't want to turn anyone away again for a lack of funds. Pay what you can for this one-night class, February 25th, 8.30 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. See you there. Now, for our episode today, the title is How Jews and Christians Read the Bible Differently, and we had two wonderful guests that both, Jared, are back. They, they've been here before, but uh, A.J. Levine, who is a professor of New Testament at Vanderbilt University, and Mark Brettler, who is a professor of Judaic Studies at Duke University, and they came out with a new book, and the title is The Bible With and Without Jesus, How Jews and Christians Read the Same Stories Differently. We had a fascinating discussion, so let's just get right into that, shall we? Absolutely. And I just want to say, we don't usually plug books like this, but just a really great book. So, we are going to plug it, The Bible With and Without Jesus. Pick it up, but first, listen to this episode. You know, the Bible is not important in Judaism. The Bible <laughs> interpreted is important in Judaism. Of course they were confused, and of course Christians today are confused. We forget that Paul's not writing to all Christians. Paul's writing to a first-generation group of Gentile Christians who are trying to figure out what it means to live in this new Messianic age. Well, AJ and Mark, welcome to our podcast again. <laughs> we are delighted to be back. <laughs> yes, we're, we're so delighted to have you back. It's fantastic. So, Okay, listen, let's get right into this topic. Um, you might not know this, but there are both Jews and Christians living in the world, right? And they have this Bible, <laughs> and they read it differently. And, and uh, you know, I think it's such a wonderful exercise to get into to talk about why Jews and Christians read really the same stories differently. And, you know, it, sometimes it's like, you're right and you're wrong and that kind of thing. But I think the issues are much more complicated than that. So, let, let's get into that. Why do Jews and Christians read the same stories differently? I'm glad you're not asking it in terms of, we're right and you're wrong, or vice versa, because that is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to claim. We never read without a context. We're always reading things in a context. So, one of the first things to consider is that Jews and Christians have very different contexts in a whole bunch of ways. So, for example, when we're ta- when AJ and I are talking about reading the Bible, we're talking about reading the Hebrew Bible, which one of the names, Tanakh, another name, Old Testament, and other names. We can have a whole podcast on the different names for this particular book. But it's not that the name of the book is different but that whether the book is a self-standing book or not, and what other literatures it relates to, those issues are fundamentally different in the different cultures. So, when a Christian reads a story, even let's start at the beginning of Genesis, uh, the story about the creation of the world, or the story about the creation of Adam in the Old Testament, well, that Old Testament, he or she is reading is part of the larger Christian Bible, which includes the New Testament, which has some very specific traditions and beliefs about what those passages mean. A Jew, on the other hand, when reading those passages, will be reading it in the Hebrew Bible as more or less a self-enclosed world. I'll come to that more or less in a second but is certainly not reading it in in reference to the New Testament, and might be reading it a little bit, depending on which Jew it is, in relation to later Jewish tradition. 
So that is one of the ways in which Jewish and Christian readings of the same words uh, will differ. I'll just mention one more, and then I'll let AJ pick things up from here. Uh, often we're also reading in different languages. Jews are reading it in the Hebrew. That is what is fundamental to the Jewish understanding of the Bible, or in some cases, a couple of chapters in Aramaic, which is one of the reasons we don't like using the word Hebrew Bible to describe this particular text. And we will go back to the Hebrew, and we'll go back to a particular Hebrew text, the Masoretic text, which has been traditional within Judaism for over a millennium. We're not going to go back, at least as Jews, Jewish scholars will be a little different, but as Jews, we're not going back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And thus, you could see, for example, if you look at a passage concerning Saul in the book of 1 Samuel, and you compare the Jewish Publication Society translation to the New Revised Standard Version of translation, the Chris, that Protestant Bible has a whole bunch of verses which are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which just aren't there in the Masoretic text. So we're not even always reading the same Bible itself. Well, that was a great start, Mark. Thank you. Um, so why do Jews and Christians read differently? Well, just corollary, not all Jews read the same way. Um, you know, heaven forbid. And Mark and I don't always agree, and we had to hash some of this stuff out. But let's see. Um, not only are we reading it in different languages, so Jews to this day are still in the synagogue reading from the Hebrew, and indeed from a scroll rather than from a book. So think about the difference between reading from a, like a book that you hold in your hand as opposed to reading online or on a Kindle. We, we punctuate differently because ancient Hebrew doesn't have vowels. So just as an experiment, you put the letters GD together and you can get God or good or EGAD or if you're generous, goody. So we have to figure out what the vowels are and therefore what the words mean. We have a different reception history. Because when, for example, the New Testament cites Isaiah 53 in terms of the person who bore our diseases and was wounded for our transgressions, they're going to come up with Jesus. That, that would be obvious. And the synagogue has come up with 15 or 20 different possible candidates for that suffering story. We read with a different anthropology because Christians typically, traditionally, start with the idea of a fall in the Garden of Eden that had to be rectified. And Jews don't talk about a fall, and we don't talk about an original sin. We might rather talk about an original opportunity. But there's no irreparable breach between humanity and divinity such that Jesus has to come and fix it. We emphasize different portions of the scripture. So, for Jews, the book of Esther is enormously important. It gets an entire holiday. And pretty much on Sunday morning, the only time one hears the book of Esther is on something like Church Woman United Sunday, where you hear, you have been chosen for such a time as this. <laughs> so, different reception histories, different emphases, different languages, different punctuations, different canonical order we're not reading the same Bible at all. And that actually is pretty good because then we don't have to wrestle over I got it right and you got it wrong. We can say, well, we may be reading the same stories, but we're reading them so differently in such different versions that we can actually share these readings with each other and figure out what we can agree upon and places where we will have to agree to disagree. Let me just pick up on something that AJ just said and develop it a tiny bit more. I should note that we do this all the time, by the way. We've gotten to the point where we finish each other's sentences. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is really good when the internet cuts out, but I hope not today. The issue of canonical order is really, really important. What is the climax of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament? Is it the book of Malachi, as it is in the Christian order, which talks about the coming of Elijah the prophet, and this is a wonderful climactic segue into the New Testament, or is it you know, the book of Chronicles, which ends with the Cyrus Declaration and welcomes the Judeans or Judahites back to their land and emphasizes the importance of land? from the Jewish perspective in terms of reading this very same book. And also, just to go back to AJ's issue of emphases, I have a visual image, which I think some of your listeners might enjoy. Even if we're reading exactly the same text, which we aren't, but let's for, let's for a moment imagine that we are, 
Jews and Christians, in essence, put different words or different chapters or different books in different sized fonts. So to pick up on what AJ just said, for Jews, Esther is a 48 font, 48 point font book. For most Christians, it's a 10 or 12 point font uh, book. Or sometimes it's the reverse. For Christians, the description of what is called, this term never appears in the Bible, the suffering servant in Isaiah chapter 53, you know, it's going to be 48 or maybe 60 point font. Most Jews have never read this chapter, have never <laughs> heard of it. It's not as if we're taking it out of the Bible, but in the way in which Jews read the Bible, you know, maybe it's an eight-point font or we'll be generous and give it 10 or 12 points. So how significant each faith community takes various chapters or sections of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament is another area where we differ very, very significantly. Or just more broadly, I'm doing, I'm, I am finishing these sentences, um, just more <laughs> broadly, the synagogue is going to concentrate on the first five books, the Torah, which means Leviticus is really important, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And you rarely hear that stuff in churches, particularly on a Sunday morning. The church is more likely to be preaching, if it's doing its quote-unquote Old Testament preaching, more likely to come from the prophets. So, even when it comes to Pentateuchal materials, we all like Genesis, but the promise of the land that Jews hear over and over again frequently drops out of Christian liturgical formulation. So, differences all over the place so that when we start talking with each other, Jews and Christians, about what strikes us in the Bible, we frequently miss because what the Jew finds important, the Christian may find irrelevant or not know very well, and vice versa. So, one of the things Mark and I are hoping is that Jews and Christians will read these texts together and then be able to see what the meanings are in the eyes of our neighbors. And that actually helps us know our neighbors better. And if we're lucky, when our neighbors give us their perspective on the text, we get to know our text better as well. Hmm. And I would just say, from the beginning of your question, you asked us about reading the same stories differently. I just want to point out that Jews and Protestants, let's leave aside the issue of translation, are more or less reading the same stories, uh, reading the same stories. But on the other hand, if you want to talk about Catholics and people in the Eastern Church, the text of Esther is different. It has a number of what are called additions that you can sometimes find in the Apocrypha. And the same thing is true of the book of Daniel. So, I often like imagining that a Jew and a Catholic are talking about the book of Esther right after the festival of Purim. And the Jew says, you know, what a strange book we have. God isn't even present explicitly in the book. Mm -hmm. And the Catholic can come and say, well, I'm sorry, I just read it a few weeks ago, and I saw a handful of references to God. So, we're not even always reading the same book. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit, um, not to get too granular, but one of the things I appreciated in your book is you talk about what I would call like the slipperiness of language, just that language itself is ambiguous. You know, AJ, you mentioned the consonants and vowels and how there aren't vowels, and so there's just this ambiguity of the text that allows for these different traditions. And uh, I, I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about how we can get so many different meanings out of, while we have very different uh, texts and we've talked about, you know, the, the, the stories can be different and there's different verses and different chapters inserted here and there, different uh, traditions do that. But even when we're reading the exact same story, we can come up with different meanings and that seems to be inherent in, in how language works, but maybe you can say a word or two about that. Or it's inherent in how human imagination works. I mean, even today, if two people watch the same television show or stream the same movie, they might get very different impressions out of it. Oh, this is an allegory. That was supposed to be funny. I didn't like it. I thought it was brilliant, and so on. So, as human beings, we're attuned to stories, and as we've seen particularly recently in the United States, we're also attuned to laws and how you interpret laws. That's why we have people like lawyers and TV commentators. So, if you have a law that says don't murder, then you have to figure out what constitutes murder and does that include manslaughter or self-protection or whatnot. So, interpretation is part of the human condition. And interpretation is required for any text that we read, because otherwise we've just got dots and dashes on a page. 
and we have to figure out what to do with it. Making it more confusing is that all translators are traitors, because every <laughs> time you translate something, something goes out that, that was in the original in terms of connotation or word association, and something usually drops in that wasn't. So, among our really good examples of this is the different way we read Isaiah chapter 7, 14, which in the Hebrew, the prophet says to the king, hey, see that pregnant young woman over there, um, and let's talk about her kid, and we're going to name him, him Emmanuel. Well, it's not actually clear who names him. And by the time he can eat solid food, your problems are going to be over. And that's in the Hebrew, which just talks about a pregnant young woman. But when you get into the Greek, the term for young woman comes in with a term that can be translated young woman, but can also be translated virgin. And now we've got something else to talk about. Yeah, well, let me add a general point and two more examples to what AJ just said. So, in terms of your question, many people see the slipperiness of language, I think that was your term, as something negative. I think we see it as something positive, and I think that often religious tradition, and especially Jewish religious tradition and interpretation, sees it as something positive. Something else that needs to be considered. The vocabulary of biblical Hebrew is tiny when compared to the vocabulary of English. So, therefore, many words naturally have homonyms because you have a fewer number of words that have to talk about the same human reality. So, we have real problems in language. So, it's, let's, let me just give you an example of that, and then I'll talk about another area of slipperiness. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where you have the phrase, listen to the beautiful alliteration, Ruach Elohim al pnei hamayim. The Ruach of God was hovering on the face of the water. Well, here, Ruach, in many cases of the Hebrew Bible, does refer to the physical wind. On the other hand, Ruach is also the word which is used for spirit. And Hebrew does not have a separate word which distinguishes spirit from wind. So that word is naturally slippery or naturally ambiguous. And you're going to have to use your know, textual hints, understandings of context, and so forth to understand what Genesis 1-2 might have originally meant. And again, something that we both emphasize is, you know, we're not total originalists. We are interested in what the text originally meant, but we don't mean to say that all people of all religious traditions need to abide by what the text originally meant. Let's take advantage of what you call the slipperiness. So that's one type of ambiguity you have. Something that we haven't talked about yet is the issue of punctuation. The original Hebrew text has no punctuation. And it's really not until the end of the first millennium of the common era that a system of cancellation of how the a word should be chanted, which was also connected to a system of punctuation, entered into the text. So again, let's take an example that's relevant for the New Testament from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. I'll just read the first four words in Hebrew. Kol kore bamidbar panu. Okay, so a voice calls out, in the desert, make way. Well, is the voice calling out in the desert or the wilderness, which is the reading that you have in the New Testament? Or is the voice calling out, colon, telling the people to make way in the wilderness? Well, if you don't have punctuation, then you have no clear way of arbitrating in most cases between such readings. And you have either horrible slipperiness or wonderful ambiguity. So, so does the quotation mark begin with in the wilderness? Yes, that is yeah, the question. That's the issue, or, right? Okay. Yeah, or is the voice calling out in the wilderness? Right, right. Both of those are possible. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. And, you know, maybe we can celebrate rather than fight. Well, I wonder, are, are they both, I, mean, I guess they're both possible, but it really seems from just the structure of that verse that it really means a voice calling out, comma, quotation, in the wilderness, right? Do you, do you agree with that, or do you see it differently? No, I agree that, let me phrase it this way, that the interpretation not found in the New Testament 
is the more likely original interpretation. Okay. The structure of the verse, the parallel, what is called the parallelism of the verse, uh, implies that the wilderness is where you are preparing the way for the Lord. Mm -hmm. But that is not the only possible interpretation. And clearly the fact that it was interpreted differently by some first century Jews suggests that even in the first century, there were different understandings of how this should be understood. Mm -hmm. It's a matter in part of what we want Scripture to do, because Scripture is not just, and we don't talk about like, you know, Homeric Scripture or Virgilist Scripture. Scripture is not just an historical document uh, for which a bunch of historians with a bunch of PhDs can go back and say, oh, this is what Isaiah originally intended, if we could determine that. But scripture also has to speak to the communities that hold it sacred, which means it cannot only mean what it meant to its original audience. We're always asking from a scriptural perspective, what does it mean to me today, or what does it mean to the covenant community at such and such a time? So, if it only meant what it meant in its historical context, there'd only be one sermon on it, because that, that would be the original meaning, and we'd have no way of having the scripture communicate to us. This particular passage from Isaiah 40 really opened up for the church because not only did it get a, a kind of background to John the Baptist out there in the wilderness proclaiming the way, but when the text goes from Hebrew into Greek, and it's the Greek primarily that the writers of the New Testament are using, when Mark picks this up, and I think it's like the third verse of the Gospel of Mark, mm -hmm. it's Mark 1-3, and it's prepare the way of the Lord. Well, the Greek word for way is hodos. You know that from the word odometer, right? It's your mileage indicator. But according to the Gospel of Luke, the early followers of Jesus didn't call themselves Christians. Jesus didn't know that word. Paul didn't know that word. That comes in really late. They called themselves followers of the way so that when Mark's readers read and Mark's Christian readers read, prepare the way, they go, oh, that's the way of Jesus because that's what we call ourselves. So, Clearly, that's not what the word meant when Isaiah was talking to a bunch of people in Babylon in the 6th century BCE, but clearly it did mean that to the followers of Jesus in the late 1st and early 2nd centuries. And that's that idea of words changing meaning over time. And, and we see that even today where, where books that, you know, we might have read with no problem 50 years ago, at least for those of us who were that old, we read today and we see the racist language and the sexist language and we cringe because we've got a different context by which to understand literature, whether for better or for worse. Hmm. That brings me, I want, maybe you can talk a little bit about this bigger picture idea of the interpreted Bible. It's something that you guys come back to again and again, and I just, I want to make sure we don't miss it, because we've been, we've been definitely weaving that idea in throughout our conversation, but maybe let's take a step back and just talk about what you mean by an interpreted Bible and how that impacts how we come to the text. Well, there's no such thing as an uninterpreted Bible. Well, unless it just sits on your shelf, right, for decoration. That's an uninterpreted Bible. Yeah. I mean, there's a wonderful story of a Hebrew Bible colleague of mine, Ed Greenstein, who taught for several years, for many years at Jewish Theological Seminary, and then at uh, Tel Aviv University, Maryland University in Israel, where his students, I'm going to get the story almost right, where his students used to complain that he cared too much about theory, and that they just wanted to hear the text speak. So, one day he came to class, he walked in at the appointed hour, he opened his Bible, and was silent for five minutes, as the students, as you could imagine, were getting more and more perplexed. And then finally he explained, well, I was trying to let the text speak for itself. <laughs> <laughs> and lo and behold, it didn't. <laughs> so, <right. laughs> That's at the point where you want Charlton Heston's voice to come in through the speaker, right? That would have done it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, especially in some theological wor worlds, there is a notion of an uninterpreted Bible but on everything, we, on, on every word, every phrase, we are making uh, interpretive judgments. We are deciding which of the various meanings or homonyms or slight shades of difference does a word mean. We are deciding what is the syntactic relation in a particular phrase, what is the subject, and 
what is the object? And those are all interpretations that we need to make in order for the text to make sense. Yeah. I once wrote something, you know, which people got a little angry at me, where I said, you know, the Bible is not important in Judaism. You know, take a breath. The Bible <laughs> interpreted is important in Judaism. And I will stand by that. And I think that's the case for Christianity as well. And I think that that is the case for any literature. Mm -hmm. A grocery list, in some cases, can speak for itself. You know, not all the time. We've all had times where you know we've come back and our spouse has not been so happy at how we interpreted that particular <laughs> grocery list. Okay, <laughs> but any literary text cannot speak for itself and requires interpretation. I wonder if it's a problem of the questions that we ask, so that sometimes students will say, or friends will say, what does this text mean? And that's probably not a very good question. You might have to gloss that. What does it mean to me today in my current situation? What did it mean to people in the first century? What did it mean to people in, in the 15th century? What does it mean to an historian? So, the texts that we're looking at, which are primarily the so-called shared scripture, like Genesis or Isaiah or Jonah, we can already ask three different questions. You know, what did it mean in its original context, as best as that meaning can be reconstructed? How does it get picked up in the New Testament? And even there, it's going to have multiple meanings. So, the suffering servant certainly refers in some texts, for example, First Peter, to the suffering and death of Jesus on the cross. But in the Gospel of Matthew, that suffering servant represents Jesus, the healer, who takes people's diseases and cures them of them. That also tells us that free health care is a miracle. And what does the <laughs> suffering servant then mean in Second Temple Judaism, the time of the New Testament, but by Jews who were not part of the Jesus movement? And what did he mean, or they mean, because sometimes it's looked at as the community of Israel, in later rabbinic thought and later medieval Jewish thought? So, you can't just stop at what does it mean? You have to gloss that. What does it mean for whom and when? Hey, everybody. Pete here. Listen, not long ago, Jared and I were on a phone call with Candace Zubernot, the founder of The Christian Closet, and we were just blown away. There is so much suffering out there, and so many people feel they have to suffer in silence, especially if you are LGBTQ and Christian. But with The Christian Closet, you don't have to go it alone. They are the first fully online, this isn't their first rodeo, folks, counseling service that specializes in the integration of faith and LGBTQ challenges. They are also the first fully LGBTQ team of counselors and coaches. Candace and her team were so generous and are offering 10% off the first six sessions. So go to thechristiancloset.com front slash contact and make sure you mention the promo code BFNP in the message box and get 10% off your first six sessions. Again, that's thechristiancloset.com front slash contact. Yeah, I, I mean, all these things are tying together with something. I think that you said earlier, Mark, you used a very interesting phrase that I I think is very intriguing about taking advantage of the slipperiness of the Bible itself. You know, there's there's no, quote, clear, unambiguous, obvious meaning you have to work for. But it, it's more than that. You're, you're talking about taking advantage of the slipperiness. And maybe could, could you riff on that a little bit more? Because I think that's taking – a problem typically, I think for a lot of people listening to the podcast, is taking a problem, oh no, we don't know exactly what this means, and you're turning that into more of an inevitable possibility. Yeah, I mean, maybe I sound like the person trained in business who when they have a problem, it's supposed to become an opportunity. But I really do believe that this is an opportunity. And here, here is where I would start with the following statement. If the Bible, and here I could be talking about the Jewish Bible, the Christian Bible, it doesn't matter, was crystal clear and was univocal. In other words, spoken one clear, consistent voice. And its interpretation was crystal clear. It would not have survived. Because part of what makes Scripture Scripture is its ability to speak to its community in different times and different places. So here, let me just, let me stick to the Hebrew Bible, what I know better. 
Okay, so this is the book, which is more than 2,000 years old, is written in the ancient Near East, uh, where life was very different, where technology was very different, and so forth. If we only took it as a book which was written for that particular generation in a language that that particular generation could understand, it would have been totally obsolete for us. Scriptural texts by their nature require flexibility so that they are able to adapt to different times and places. Now, of course, one very good question which theologians need to ask, and i that's not a word I use of myself, is you know, to what extent do we adapt Scripture to our own situation, making it more flexible, as opposed to to what extent do we need to be more flexible, adapting ourselves to the more ancient situation of Scripture? Oh, that's a difficult situation. That's a difficult question. I'll leave that for theologians. But I'll still stand by my statement that if it were a crystal clear, univocal book, it would not have survived. Mm -hmm. Nor would it have survived without that type of interpretation, because people would have looked at part of it and said, oh, no, I'm simply not going there. So, one of the things that we do see in, in Judaism and Christianity, because I am interested in questions of law, like, you know, how do we govern ourselves? We've got that eye for an eye, which is typically cited in polls as the major reason why people are in favor of capital punishment, because, you know, the Old Testament, quote unquote, says an eye for an eye. When Jesus evokes that passage in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you have heard it said an eye for an eye. And then he proceeds to change the subject, right? So, he, he goes from, except, you know, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other. Well, that's not, I mean, an eye for an eye means somebody actually takes out your eye. And there's a big difference between losing a limb and getting slapped on the cheek. And rabbinic tradition says, oh, well, since no two eyes are equal, this has to be a legal principle that says in the case of actual physical injury, there should be some sort of compensation. And then they work out a formula for pain and medical expenses and so on. So, the text shows us that it, it's necessarily interpreted right from the get-go. And even something that might be really clear, like an eye for an eye, isn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I just add to that, that one of the big contributions of biblical studies and let's say the last 40 years or so is what is often called interbiblical interpretation. There are different words we could use for that, but that shows that within the Hebrew Bible itself, earlier books, which are now part of the Hebrew Bible, have been interpreted. So, Deuteronomy interprets sections of Exodus. Chronicles interpret sections of Samuel Kings in a variety of places. Uh, several Psalms interpret the promise of an eternal dynasty to David that is found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So, interpretation is embedded in the earliest form of Scripture. And therefore, if we're going to take Scripture seriously, then we need to take the fact of its centrality of interpretation and the necessity of interpretation seriously as well. I think it's a really good point because we often talk on this show about how, you know, we want to follow in the Bible's trajectory and what we see it doing within itself. And so, maybe can you do a deeper dive on, I'm thinking of this phrase you used, you know, of revelatory exegesis or revelatory interpretation where there's, a, you know, God reveals a new meaning or a new interpretation to our community based on these older texts. So, is there a specific text that you can maybe dig into where we see the Bible doing this? The clearest place where this appears in the Bible is in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel. Where there, Daniel is introduced in verse 2, so I'm going to translate loosely from the Hebrew. In the first year of his reign, and it's referring in the previous verse to Darius, I, Daniel, was contemplating the books. Concerning the number of years which the word of the Lord was to Jeremiah the prophet to fulfill the destruction of Jerusalem, 70 years. Okay, let me point something out. I mean, 70, this is based on a prophecy that you have two times in the book of Jeremiah. The most famous is in Jeremiah chapter 25, which suggests Babylonian world domination for a 70-year period. And 70 years, nothing could be clearer 
in 70 years. It's like saying that your tax returns need to be postmarked by midnight of April 15th, assuming it's not a weekend, okay? So you can't go to the IRS and say, oh, by April 15th, I thought you really meant May 28th. Okay, you can try, but I don't think that that is likely to be very successful. So he's thinking about that. He's praying over that. There's a beautiful prayer that you have there. And eventually, in that very same chapter, this is why it is called a revelatory exegesis. There you have in verse 21. So I'm still speaking by prayer. This is Daniel speaking. And the man Gabriel... Whom I, had, whom I had seen in an earlier vision, flying around, touched me uh, at the time of the evening offering. And then he explains that the meaning of 70 is 490. So give me a minute, I need to explain this. So in Hebrew, and again, let me go back to AJ's point, that in this period, Hebrew was written without vowels. So in Hebrew, the word for shiv'im that is used in those places in Jeremiah is shiv'im, normal way of saying 70. But those same consonants, five or six consonants, could also be read, read as shavu'im, weak. So in this prophecy in Daniel 9, the angel Gabriel tells Daniel, oh yeah, why don't you read the word twice? Why don't you read it first? It's Shiv'im, 70. Then it's Shavu'im, weeks. In other words, seven. And multiply 70 times seven, and you get 490 years. So what this does is it gives Jeremiah's prophecy a 420-year extension right? Because 490 minus 70 is 420. Why is this necessary? Because the book of Daniel is written from the scholarly perspective, and I firmly believe in this, in the second pre-Christian century, under the, the time of the persecution of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, where Jerusalem was not doing well at all. And it seemed like Jeremiah's prophecy had not been fulfilled. So through this revelatory interpretation through this through the angel Gabriel, uh, Jeremiah is given a 420 year extension. And this type of revelatory interpretation uh, is very important in this period. We see it in a large number of books, which are called apocalyptic books, in which these intermediaries, that's probably a better term than angels, who explain the divine will to people, are also the people who explain what the text really meant. That was a great example, Mark. Um, just for another example, texts that would not have been looked at as prophecy become prophecy when, for example, Jesus' followers or the later rabbinic tradition start reflecting back on them. So, that when Jeremiah, because he's, he's a good source for a lot of this stuff, when Jeremiah, reflecting on the, the Judahites who were being taken into exile in Babylon and being marched past the, the tomb of the matriarch Rachel, Jeremiah talks about Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more. Well, that's not a prophecy, that's a statement of fact that Jeremiah is witnessing, historically speaking. But when Matthew reads that text, uh, Matthew puts that text uh, as a commentary on what's called the slaughter of the innocents, when King Herod the Great, finding out that there's this new child who's being identified as king of the Jews, and Herod, who calls himself king of the Jews, finds this a bit problematic, because he thinks there can only be one, and that should be he, um, arranges to have all the children of Bethlehem slaughtered. So, when the children are slaughtered, Matthew says this was done to fulfill what was said by the prophet, Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more. Um, so, for that, uh, for Matthew, Jeremiah speaking to his own historical context as a statement of fact becomes, in effect, a prophecy, which is then fulfilled in the lifetime of Jesus. And that happens over and over again in the New Testament when you get, this was done to fulfill what was said by so-and-so, and not necessarily prophetic material. 
So the prophets are continually being redeployed from making statements that clearly are anchored in their own historical context into making statements that look forward 700 years, 800 years, 500 years, and so on. And the Jewish tradition will do the same thing. Yeah, that, that's part of just what happens, right, AJ? This is this is the bringing of this ancient text into our present moment. And so you take historical statements and you turn them into prophecies. And it's more than that, because it's not only historical statements. It's entire books, like the Book of Psalms. The Book of Psalms originally was a prayer book. But let's take Psalm 2, for example, where you have the nation's... Uh, gathering together, I'm in Psalm 2, verse 2, against the Lord, the al and against his Messiah. Sorry, you can't see me. I put the word Messiah in, in scare quotes, <laughs> because in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, the Hebrew word Mashiach never means Messiah. In the, in the word anointed, Mashiach, Christos, never refers to the future ideal Davidic king. But for the early church, that original meaning was not important, and the original use of Psalms was not important. And therefore, uh, a chapter like Psalm 2 in the New Testament, and even at various points in later Christian tradition, is understood as a prophecy about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, that's another way in which a whole book shape changes as a result of understanding it prophetically. Yeah. Well, you know, and not to open up a whole other can of worms here, but again, I'm thinking about a lot of our listeners. Just to bring Paul into this a bit, you know, he took his scripture very seriously, and he was always you – know, reading Paul's use of his scripture is – you're, you're sort of on a hermeneutical adventure at that point because he's doing all sorts of interesting things. And I have found that it's, it's a tough thing for many Christians to, to look at and to sort of come to terms with that Paul is really doing some very creative things with the interpretation of his text, which is right along the lines of all the stuff we're talking about here in this episode. He turns the story of Sarah and Hagar into an, a complete allegory, where Sarah, whose name doesn't get mentioned, this is Galatians 4, Sarah, she's our mother above and it's spiritual, and she represents these these Gentile believers who have come into the Jesus movement, this, this messianic movement, apart from Jewish law, which is entirely appropriate and then Hagar is the slave base, you know, out on Mount Sinai, and she represents these Gentile believers who were still under the law. Well, I don't think other first century Jews are going there. So, uh, <laughs> you but you can, you can take Sarah and Hagar and say they represent this or they represent that. Um, and there are multiple stories about Sarah and Hagar in rabbinic literature. And here we have to worry about what Paul is doing. So, if Christians today are confused by Paul's redeployment of what gets what the Christians would call the Old Testament, you can imagine how his first converts felt, because those converts to whom he is writing in Galatia or in Philippi or in Thessalonica, they're Gentiles, they're pagans. So, they've got a really big learning curve here because they've got to get a copy of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the scriptures, and then Paul has to tell them how to read it. And these poor folks, so they're reading in Genesis, you know, unless you are circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, you're cut off from the covenant. I'd like to think that's a pun. I can't prove it, but I think it's kind oh, of funny. Yeah. I hope it um, is. And they're going, you know, so maybe we should do this. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Because in the Messianic age, one of the signs of the Messianic age, this comes from Zechariah and from Isaiah, um, is that the Gentile nations, the pagans, would turn toward the God of Israel, but they don't convert to Judaism because then the only people who would be worshiping God would be Jews. So, you've got to have pagans here, and, and now you can't see me, but I've got my hands up. You've got to have pagans here and Jews here, and together as equals, they're worshiping the God of Israel, but the Jews are doing it through Torah law. And the pagans are doing it through their faith in Christ. And this Christ figure is uniting them all in this messianic movement. So, on the one hand, you've got Paul quoting this, this quote-unquote Old Testament scripture over and over again. Paul would never have used the term because there's no New Testament yet. And at the same time saying, but here's what it means. And it doesn't mean what you think it means. Of course they were confused. And of course Christians today are confused. And part of that comes from the fact that we forget that Paul's not writing to all Christians, Paul's writing to a first-generation group of Gentile Christians who are trying to figure out what it means to live in this new messianic age. 
Yeah, let me come back to one word, which you said earlier, namely the word redeployment, which is a super important and a super useful word. And let me just mention that what is happening in the New Testament in terms of redeployment of the Hebrew Bible, that was part of first century interpretation. So when many people talk about Christianity in reference to the Dead Sea Scrolls, they often think that we're looking for John the Baptist or Jesus in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you're welcome to look. You're not going to find either of those figures in the scrolls. But what you do find is precisely this type of redeployment use of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, this has been known for a long time. One of the earliest scrolls which was discovered and then disseminated is called Pesher Habakkuk. It is a one of several Pesher texts. And the way in which Peshers work is they redeploy texts. So the book of Habakkuk, if you read it, is about the Assyrian enemy of, of Judah, but that is totally redeployed in the Pesher in reference to the Romans. So the way in which the Christian authors, whether it's Paul or Jesus, understand the old text in reference to their contemporaneous situation was very much a part of at least one brand of interpretation that was common in the first century of the common era. Well, I say this, I think, every episode that I say, unfortunately, we need to wrap things up, but I really mean it this time, that it's very unfortunate. <laughs> you never meant it before. <laughs> it's very unfortunate, because I feel like we could just keep this conversation going. It's all so, not just fascinating, but I think really helpful. So, if we can end with, with one question, which would be, for all, for all of our listeners who, who, some of these things may be new for them, what would be a word of advice now, as they go into their communities of faith, as they read their Bibles, uh, what would be one helpful helpful tip or one practical thing you can leave with them? I'll start. When you read, um, don't default to some sort of lowest common denominator where you and everybody else will come to some agreement on something that will wind up being really quite banal. Don't sacrifice the particulars of your own tradition on, on the altar of interface sensitivity. Jews are going to read as Jews. Christians are going to read as Christians. Um, Messianic Jews will be somewhere in between. But it, it, at least open up to the possibility that although you do not agree with the person who's not part of your community, you don't accept that particular reading, at least be able to understand the logic where it came from rather than just say, oh, that's nonsense, or if you'd simply read more closely, you'd see the truth of. To grant that it might not be your reading, but it's nevertheless a, a reading with its own logic, its own history, and its own meaning to the individual and the community that preserves it. And I'm going to follow the example of the Bible, which keeps rewriting itself in different ways. And I'm going to conclude with a quote, which is attributed either to George Bernard Shaw, Winston Churchill, or Oscar Wilde, depending on okay. where you read it, which is, England and America are two countries separated by a common language. And I'd like to revise that to say, Judaism and Christianity are two religions separated by a common scripture. And I think our job is to really understand what we have in common and to emphasize that at least as much as what separates us. Well, and on that note, we sadly say we are out of time here, but this was so fascinating. I want to thank you both for taking the time. I know, Mark, you're a little bit distant from us here today physically, and AJ is a little bit too, but not quite as much. But uh, thank you very much for being on our podcast. We had a great time talking about this very, very important, very timely, and not going anywhere issue of how Jews and Christians read the Bible differently. Thanks for letting us talk about it. Sure. Thank you, and warmest regards from Jerusalem. And from Nashville. <laughs> All right, folks, thanks for listening to another episode of the podcast. And, you know, you may have heard some words and some terms in this episode that need some explanation. And Jared and I do that. We do that after every episode. We call it the afterword. And you may have heard things like Tanakh or Masoretic or Aramaic 
or a, what other words, Jared? Apocrypha, Apocrypha pe- yeah, that's Pesher. Uh, Pesher, yeah. right. Things like that. And, and, and you know, Mark was throwing some Hebrew terms around. But this is where we discuss some of these things in more depth and sort of fill in some gaps and just have some great time together thinking about some of these issues, how they impacted us, and getting into some of the nitty-gritty. Yeah, so if you haven't already, just check it out. Patreon.com front slash the Bible for normal people. It is the afterword is what you're looking for, where we take, you know, 10, 15, 15 minutes to dive into these episodes with our guests and unpack some of the things that we talked about. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. We also want to give a shout out to our producers group who support us over on Patreon. They are the reason we are able to keep bringing podcasts and other content to you. So a big thanks to Mark, Justin Brown, Sarah Overly, Mark Sims, Peter and Mary Wall, Leroy Prempe, Fred Anderson, Travis Jantz, Jay Baston, and Robert Sidlaski. If you would like to help support the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash the Bible for normal people, where for as little as $3 a month, you can receive bonus material, be a part of an online community, get course discounts, and much more. We couldn't do what we do without your support. Thanks to our team. Executive producer, Megan Kamick. Audio engineer, Dave Gerhardt. Creative director, Tessa Stoltz. Marketing wizard, Reed Lively. Transcriber and community champion, Stephanie Spate and web developer Nick Striegel. For Pete, Jared, and the entire Bible for Normal People team, thanks for listening. The title of the book is uh, Reading the Bible with... (laughs) Dave, you're going to have to edit this together. The title of the book is Reading with... not reading. Oh, gosh. (laughs) The title of the book is, Dave, I'm so glad you're alive and you can just splice these things together.